As always, I'd like to remind everybody that any views in this presentation are that of the presenter and not of the IFE. We are recording and the webinar should be available from our website within the next couple of days. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat and at the end of the presentation, we can work through the questions with Joe. Please don't put your hands up and please keep your mics off and your cameras off if you're not presenting. OK, Joe, I'll pass over to you. Thank you very much, Dana. Let me uh, share my screen, make sure we can all see what we're supposed to before I kick off. So is that OK? Have you just got the PowerPoint there, uh, Dana? Yep, that looks great. Really good. Then I'll uh, then I'll start. So good evening, everyone. Thank you for, for dialing in. It's another good turnout this uh, this month, which is great. Um, so my name's Joe Hart. I'm the vice president of the Southern branch of the Institution of Fire Engineers. I've got a couple of other roles I'll tell you about. And tonight I'm going to be talking to you guys about the London Plan Policy D12. We do a webinar every month as the Southern branch, the first Wednesday of the month. I do four of them per year, so broadly I suppose we are now in quarter two of the year, aren't we? So this is number two this year that I've done. Always on a topic related to fire safety, usually fire engineering if it's me talking, but we have folks come and talk about any, any sort of subject related to fire. So this afternoon, as I say, we're going to talk about the London Plan Policy D12. This is one that was um, suggested actually by one of our members. We are open entirely to people getting in touch and saying we'd like some more information from you guys or just a, a webinar tutorial if you can about something. So that's where we put this one together. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give an overview of policy D12. And it really is about awareness. Anyone who was in my last webinar about past the line 80 at the start of the year, it's very similar to that one. We're not necessarily training and learning how to do these documents. What we're looking at is awareness and, and helping frame them for us in the fire industry uh, to understand what these documents are. So very briefly, I've been watching all the names come through. Lots of us do know each other. That's great. Uh, good to see you all. But for anyone that doesn't, my name is, is Joe Hart. I split my time between two roles. I run the Delta Fire Group for about half my time. So I'm the director of Delta Fire Engineering, Delta Fire Safety and Delta Fire Testing. We're a trio of companies uh, operating in the UK, actually based in London predominantly. So London plans are very much part of what we do. I'm a fire engineer by trade. I did my degree initially in fire engineering and my master's degree in fire and explosion engineering. I've been a consultant for the past few years working in the UK. I now also split my time in academia. So I'm lecturer in fire engineering at the University of Central Lancashire. So I specialise in teaching. Webinars not dissimilar to this. Some of you may have actually seen this presentation if you're one of my students. Uh, taking all the academic background and giving it to industry. So talking about how we take those skills and apply those uh to the work that we do in industry my contact details are on there do jot them down get in touch i'm usually pretty good on the emails uh i'm a bit busy at the minute because i've got 21 dissertations were handed in this week but uh we're getting through it and yeah i'll come back to you with questions if we don't get to them today so the webinar itself today we're going to talk through the london plan 2021 uh the first thing i'm going to do is describe the scope the the individual came to us and asked us to cover this it was interested in some of the background and context to the document itself which i thought was rather interesting so I took the opportunity to read it myself which I've not done for a good couple of years I actually read the previous London plan before the 2021 version came out but we'll go through some of the scope the contents of the London plan itself looking beyond fire safety at first but then focusing in on policy d12 which is for us in the fire industry to be focusing in on uh, we're going to discuss some of the key fire safety contents that we put into what we call a planning fire safety strategy or a fire statement if there's one takeaway from this presentation it's those two terms the fact that they are different terms and that depending on which policy we're looking at in terms of the London plan, it's a very different document that we would produce. Um, and then I'm going to relate that to fire statement. So one of the biggest queries I get in industry when I'm working on these is, is this fire statement the same as that other fire statement we have to do sometimes as well? So more of a question that we'll come back to at the end uh, to help differentiate between the types of reports we might produce. I always like to give a bit of a session uh, intention here. So who, who is the target audience of these things? Well, it is you guys, it's the members of the Institution of, of Fire Engineers. Broadly for people who are fire professionals, not necessarily engineers, not necessarily just approvals or operational firefighters. Anyone with an interest in this document is, is more than welcome. And as Dana said at the beginning, we record all of these. You can watch these back later. So thank you if you're darling in watching this later on uh, on YouTube or the website, wherever it might be. So let's get into it. So. One of the modules I teach at the University of Central Lancashire is on fire safety law. Some of you looking at the names have endured that module taught by me. It's one of my favourite modules I teach, actually. 
Um, and I'm going to very briefly talk about this here. One of the case studies we've used in that module before, which is the Great London Authority Act to help us kind of get to where we need to be with the fire safety, uh, the plan statements and the fire statements. We need to start here with a piece of legislation. So a piece of legislation because it's an act, it's primary legislation, which means that it's legally enforceable. Uh, and this particular act came in in 1999, the Greater London Authority Act. And what that did was it established a number of organisations within London. It established the Greater London Authority, the GLA, the London Assembly and the Mayor of London. Now, the Mayor of London as uh, a role is a role that's existed for hundreds of years, but in its current form, it's existed only since the year 2000. And there have only been three mayors of London under this particular act in its current role, which is the Mayor of London who's held accountable by the London Assembly and sits as the chief executive of the Greater London Assembly. So it's important for us to understand this is a relatively new uh, framework that we work within in London. And this came from a referendum that occurred in 1998 to do with the devolution of power in London to give a devolved power authority to the GLA, the London Assembly and the Mayor of London. There was a poll that reads as it is on screen there, are you in favour of the government's proposals for a Greater London Authority? And the yes vote was over 72%. So overwhelmingly, there was a majority to say that this should be established. So we got what we call the Greater London Authority, who oversee um, Greater London, the London Assembly, who hold the Mayor of London to account as well. So a little bit of theory for us before we get into our technical fire stuff. And as part of that uh, Act of Parliament, there is what is called a Spatial Development Strategy, an SDS. Now, that particular Act of Parliament we're just looking at sets out exactly what the Mayor of London has to do and how they are appointed and how they're held accountable and all these other things throughout their tenure. And Article 334 is really important. It's the one that's on screen there, screenshotted. It says that the Mayor has to prepare and publish a document known as a Spatial Development Strategy. And what the SDS has to do is set out the Mayor's plans for the next 20 or 25 years for London in terms of all different areas of growth, development, planning, housing, transport, all sorts of things to do with the city, as part of their role as mayor and that's a legal requirement because it sits within that act of parliament and it's article 334 there as i say if you look at article 334 part one the mayor shall prepare and publish a document to be known as a spatial development strategy now for those that requested this webinar specifically one of the questions was what is the london plan what what is it and why does it exist well the london plan is that legal requirement that the mayor has to produce so if you look at the front page of the london plan as we've got on the right hand side there it says at the bottom the spatial development strategy for greater london so the Mayor of London has a legal requirement to set out a plan for 20 or 25 years in future in terms of all different types of areas of, of planning. And the London plan is how they do that. So the London plan is freely available. It's published by the Mayor of London with the Greater London Authority for us to download and look at. It's the spatial development strategy for the whole of Greater London. And it's that framework for how London will develop over that next period of years. It's part of that statutory development plan for London meaning that those policies that form the plan, and it is a series of policies, it's this is what should be enacted for any development occurring within the City of London, and in fact all of Greater London, it should then inform the decision of planning applications across the capital. And one of the main reasons for that is that there should be this joined up way um, that reflects the overall strategy for how London can develop sustainably, which the London plan sets out. So even though there are 32 boroughs within London, all of whom have different rules and policies, they should be consolidated by the London plan because that's the overarching plan, the overarching strategic plan, not just for individual areas, but actually looking forward many, many years across the whole of Greater London there. And I do think the image on the front there is rather good as well. It's a good piece of art. So that's what the London plan is. So to answer that first question that we were asked as part of this webinar series to, to get to, what is the London plan? It's that spatial development strategy. It's the Mayor of London saying, if, if London is to progress in the way that we want it to, this is what ought to happen in terms of planning, development, transport, architecture, sustainability, everything. It's all captured in here. It's about a 620 page document. I don't recommend reading the whole thing, but we'll target some areas as part of this webinar that we'll go through. And we are ultimately coming to policy related to fire safety, of course. Now, just to fill in a couple of those gaps, I mentioned, uh, I remember reading Boris Johnson's um, version of the London plan. So that was published in 2015. Prior to that, there was the first iteration. Remember, it was only in the year 2000 we got this framework established. So Ken Livingstone wrote the first of these London plans. They did exist in another form prior to this, prior to that Act of Parliament. But broadly, we have now had three. Each one, uh, despite setting out the plan for the next 20 or 25 years, uh, has been rewritten every few years. So that one's had nine. Boris Johnson's lasted six years, then gets rewritten. And broadly, they have different uh, focuses. So these are 
written by political figures. They come in, they have different plans, different strategies. The current London plan, of course, written by Sadiq Khan, the current uh, mayor of London. I would urge people, uh, if we're working in fire, we're working anywhere within approvals or building design, to read at least paragraph one or section one rather. Um, and the forward written by the mayor, it gives a very clear focus on what the London plan statement is for the next 20, 25 years from 2021. There, there is a real focus on there on housing. So getting over what he calls the housing crisis, what larger wider government calls the housing crisis as well. Talking about sustainable homes and how we can build those and build an infrastructure as well to London to sustain those homes. Really important for us in the built environment to understand that is a key driver of the London plan for the next couple of decades. And there's a particular area in there, a particular phrase that comes up a lot called good growth, GG, as it's referred to, which we'll show on the next slide. It, London plan, I'm reading now from the slide, sets out a new way of doing things, something I call good growth. And throughout the London plan, even in our policy D12 that we'll come on to for fire, refers very often back to this idea of GG, the good growth principles of which there are six. This is what they look like. Now, normally when I write these webinars, I struggle for photographs. Uh, this time I just picked nice ones of London. So lots of random images of London dotted throughout this, uh, this presentation, as you'd expect. Good growth is one of the underpinning principles of all the policies within this iteration of the London plan, and they very often refer back to. One thing in the London plan to be aware of is that there are lots of acronyms and abbreviations. It has a very good glossary at the end for if you ever get lost, as I do very often. GG is one that comes up a lot, and it's this good growth. They're the six good growth principles that underpin why the policies have been written in a certain way. So the first of these is to build strong and inclusive communities. That's good growth uh, policy number one. Making the best use of land. There is, of course, a lot of mention within the London plan about how land is to be used, whether we've got brownfield, greenbelt sites, uh, areas of protected development, all these, these things that relate to us in the built environment. Creating a healthy city, uh, as we would have a lot of these, these days on any project, lots of sustainability requirements to meet a lot of uh, uh, health of residents as well to, to meet in housing. Delivering the homes that Londoners needs is good growth uh, policy number four, growing a good economy and increasing efficiency and resilience. It's very important this because this changes per London plan. If you read Ken Livingstone's plan, for example, back from 2004, it was all about an economic centre, making London a global city, 24 hour city based around trade. Boris Johnson's changed again and Sadiq Khan's again has changed slightly. So it's all about this this future, particularly in the built environment. So for us as consultants, well, me as a consultant, it's worth being aware of these and seeing why it is that we have development in London and why it's built in a certain way. Worth just as before we get into the policies, it's worth looking at some of the objectives, the wider objectives. The London plan applies throughout, as we've said already, the 32 boroughs of London, the City of London Corporation, and the MDCs, the Mayoral Development Corporations, which there were two in 2021 when this was written. But it relates always back to the overall, the overarching legal requirements of the Great London Authority when it was established, which is the three bullet points at the bottom there, to promote economic development and wealth creation in Greater London, to promote social development in Greater London, and to promote the improvement of the environment in Greater London as well. So again, very often throughout the policy, throughout the document, we'll see references back to these overarching principles, references back to the GG principles, the good growth principles, um, and lots of references as well to previous London plans and how this one is very different. So for us to understand why we're being asked to write these documents and how we go about writing them and how projects develop with through planning and, and fire safety comes into that, worthwhile is understanding these principles that sit behind them. I very often reference these, in fact, when I'm working in this area to say, I understand the kind of wider context. I, I always, anyone that's been to my webinars or had lessons from me before at the university, You'll know full well, I very often refer back to, don't just read that section of the guidance you need, read the one before and the one after, see it within context, read the whole section if you can every time you pick up a guidance. The same here for the London plan, it's well worth reading. So the way in which it's set out, uh, chapter one is what we've just covered a little bit. It's the mayor's forward and some of the definition of good growth. We've basically just covered that, but it's not particularly long. I do recommend having a read of those if you can. Um, right here in the next one or two months. Someone's just, can you someone just mute her microphone and get a little feedback? I think you've muted Joe. Okay, sorry, Joe. Yeah, you're mute. How's that? Am I back? Yeah, yeah thank you. I think Dean muted me when he was trying to mute someone else. I'm back. Um, I'll start this slide again. 
So uh, the contents of the London plan, as I say, chapter one is this mayor's forward and the definition of good growth, which we've just covered uh, on our preceding couple of slides. Chapter two gives the wider context of the London plan and how it's looking to uh, establish the wider principles geographically across Greater London. Some very good definitions in there of different areas of London, some of the history and how it's developed. Anyone who likes history like I do, it's quite a good read. Top tip, if you are looking to move to an area of London, have a read of chapter two of the London plan because it will tell you everything you need to know. If you're looking at buying a place in London, it's essential reading. I wish I had been told that when I was living in London a few years ago. So yeah, chapter two is very, very good for that overall strategic uh, look at the wider city. And then there's this series of chapters, three to 12, which gives us our policy. So these are the ways in which the mayor and the Greater London Authority and the London Assembly look to enact those overall principles that they're trying to do for the next period of years. So chapter three is the one that we're going to come on to. That's uh, all to do with design, but it's worth just casting our eye over some of the other ones. There are, of course, policies related to uh, transport in chapter 10, sustainable infrastructure, chapter nine, heritage and culture. Again, when I give people advice and I say, don't just read your bit, read everyone else's, I do recommend reading these. If you're working on heritage projects, read chapter seven for sure. Working on anything in infrastructure, doing work for uh, airport terminals or or rail stations or tube stations, definitely have a read of chapter 10, understand the wider context of these projects. But chapter three is where we're really focusing on now because that's where our policy related to fire safety specifically comes from. So chapter three, there are 14 policies within this particular chapter. They are policies D1 to D14. These are all related to the design of uh, the built environment within Greater London under the London plan. One thing to note because it's caught me out before is why they're called D1 to D14. Policy D is because it's design. If I flick back very quickly, all of the housing uh, policies are H1 to H14 again, I think, or H16. The transport ones are T1 to T9, uh, I think it is. I can't remember those, so I might be wrong. Whereas in my mind, in the building regulations, I'm very used to there being a policy A, B, C, D, E and F. Uh, in actual fact here, you take the first letter of what those are. So in our case, design, so D, and we get our policies D1 through to D14. And these covers all areas, these cover, sorry, all areas of the design of the built environment that we might find ourselves working on. So examples would be policy D5 relates to inclusive design. We'll come back to talk about that one later on. Uh, D9 relates to tall buildings, give policies for tall building environments in Greater London. D10, basement development. I'm doing a couple of these at the moment where I've had to draw on policy D10, where we've got uh, basements under residential uh, excavation projects. D14 is noise. We can see that these are related to lots of different areas to do with design. Um, but the key one for us, or the key one that this webinar is aimed at, is for fire safety, which is our policy D12 down here at the bottom. I've listed these out just for our information and another nice photograph of London. Um, Policy D1, London's form, character and capacity for growth. That one in actual, and to be fair, is worth a read. I read that one in full earlier this week just because it was of interest to me because I'm doing some work in a, a heritage area at the moment with listed facades and things. Uh, infrastructure requirements, delivering good design, public realm, accessible housing, all these areas that very much feed into the good growth principles, the six principles of the London plan. And then we find ourselves down the bottom there with uh, policy D12, which is for fire safety, where we're gonna now focus for the next uh, next few slides. And again, remember that these are the design. Chapter three is all to do with design. So D is why it's policy D1, D2. If you pick up a, a report or a piece of work and it says policy H something, you know it's in the area um, of the housing section, which is I think chapter four of the London plan. So fire safety, um, London plan, Policy D12 is fire safety. It's outlined in a number of sections within the document. As I say, the document's free to download. It's published by the mayor for the, for the residents, the citizens of London, for us all to uh, pick up and read. Within sections 3.12 to uh, 3.11, we get all of these. The, the notation of those makes sense. It's chapter three, uh, policy 12, and then it's sections one to 11, outlines some guidance to do with our policies. And we actually have, just drilling down even further, we have two policies. So we have policy D12A and D12B. So lots of us will be familiar with these. I'm hoping that we can give a bit of context and useful for us to understand what they mean and how we can uh, develop fire strategies around them. Policy D12A applies to all developments, whereas D12B applies to major developments. Now it's not an either or, they're actually additional. So a major development should be submitted with information relating to all of the policies D12 of D12A, as well as all the policies of D12B. The D12B requirements, are additional 
to what everything has to submit. But where we have a major development, we've got additional things we have to submit as part of that process earlier in the project here at planning. And what these policies actually look like, we'll come on to those in just a second, but they outline requirements that the proposals must meet. But as with most of our fire safety, uh, well, certainly all of our fire safety guidance, they're functional objectives, they're questions. It says we should demonstrate this, demonstrate that. It's not absolute requirements. This isn't legislation, primary or secondary, that tells us the way in which we must behave. It says that we must demonstrate how we have met this particular functional objective as part of the design at planning. So we'll start with D12A. And as I say, this is a presentation that is designed really to give awareness of. So we're not going to go through everything in absolute detail here. In actual fact, this is part of a larger CPD presentation we do that lasts uh, half a day. I've only got about 40 minutes this evening. But we'll look through each of them and we'll pick out some individual points of, of interest for us to be thinking about. So D12A, as I say, is this London plan policy that relates to all development proposals. There is this sentence at the top that precedes each of the requirements. So in the interests of fire safety and to ensure the safety of all building users, all development proposals must achieve the highest standards of fire safety and ensure that they dot 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 do these six things. And drilling down even further, this is the, the final drill down. We've got policy D12A, section one, section two, section three, section four. So we've got six of these that we have to meet for every project that we submit. The first one of these is to identify suitably positioned unobstructed outside space, first of all for appliances, fire appliances to be positioned on, and secondly for use as an evacuation assembly point. Now when I'm looking at a, a design here, again if I'm being it, with my commercial hat on, I'm looking at the site plan and I'm thinking about the site context and how we might get a fire appliance to this area. Of course living and working in London, um, well, I live up north now but I've lived in London for years, I predominantly work in London, I know there's lots of little side streets where it's difficult to drive an appliance down, lots of intricacies to do with routes in and out of sites where we've got to reverse appliances, things like that. So in order to meet that requirement to demonstrate we've designed in accordance with policy D12A part one, I'd be looking at a site plan and saying this is the requirement, this is how we'll get an appliance there. And similarly for an evacuation assembly point. Now as an engineer, I don't normally design the evacuation assembly point. Perhaps later in a design, if I'm doing some fire safety management and I'm looking at the later REBA stages, uh, six and seven and moving on from there. But at this point, I'm looking at how if we had to evacuate, if I've determined it's a simultaneous evacuation, how am I going to get all those people to a place of safety away from the building? And I have to demonstrate that as part of this plan. Moving on to D12A uh, part two, designed to incorporate appropriate features, reduce the risk to life, including appropriate fire alarm systems, passive and active safety measures. So I'm defining at this point what uh, active and passive measures I'm putting into the building. For example, is there a fire alarm system going in? Have we got compartment lines, fire resisting doors and walls? How are we maintaining the uh, space, uh, the separation between an external cladding system, for example, cavity barriers, things like that? They all fall into our policy here. Policy D12A part three, constructed in an appropriate way to minimise the risk of fire spread. Well, again, we might be looking at how we're going to mitigate fire spread, uh, flame propagation on the outside face of a building, or we might be looking at space separation to buildings next door. All these considerations we have to have early in a project and input into a planning stage, we're documenting in accordance with these six policies that we have here. Number four, suitable and convenient means of escape, associated evacuation strategy for all building users. Certainly when I write a fire strategy, it's one of my first considerations means of escape being my the flip into building regulations mode for a second performance requirement B1 I'm really interested because there's lots of knock on effects any of my students who have sat my final year module this year on the engineering will know that we talked about a small decision you make related to the fire uh, evacuation strategy might impact your compartmentation strategy in turn your firefighting operation strategy in turn your fire alarm all these things that knock on they have to be decided very early on so as part of policy D12 A4 we're determining those. Part five, develop a robust strategy for evacuation, which can be periodically updated and published, which all building users can have confidence in. So not only what is the overall strategy, but how do we communicate that? So within here, we might say something like, we are gonna have, if it's a simultaneous evacuation strategy, a system whereby occupants are alerted. And if it's a residence, for example, how do we relay that information to them? If it changes, how do we give that information? Do we retrain building occupants? Um, how do we ensure that we've got that golden thread once the building is occupied? And then a uh, policy D12, still part A, but number six here, the final one of policy D12A, provides suitable access and equipment for firefighting, which is appropriate for the size and use of the development. So not only where do we going to position our fire appliances, but what do we need in the building? Do we need a dry riser? Where's our water supply? 
Uh, do we have perimeter access to the building? Do we have a firefighting shaft, firefighting lifts? All these different things that we have to input into here to demonstrate how we've met policy D12 part A. So a bit of a, a spin through those specific policies there. As I say, this isn't a, oh no, I've lost one of my nice photographs of London. Um, this isn't a specific training session, so we're not going to go through those in full detail, but I do want to specifically drill in on this term here, which is a planning fire safety strategy. So off the back of the London plan, there are a series of guidance notes. They came out as draft and went out for consultation and then disappeared a bit. And that, you know, we can still get hold of those if we need to. Um, it gives us guidance around how to go about documenting these things. So not just write down policy D12A number one and then a bit of text underneath. There are specifics we need to document uh, in these reports. And it says very clearly in there that if it's a D12A, so applies to any development, but not a major development, this is what we should be calling a planning fire safety strategy, a PFSS. Um, and it, it needs to be compiled and submitted as part of that planning application. There's some guidance around the way in which this should be presented. It says it should be presented as a standalone document so that it is easy to find and share with stakeholders for coordination during the design. It should be submitted in a digital format, which will support the golden thread of fire safety information. So circulated around a design team, coordinated with disciplines and approval authorities over to the fire brigade and also digitally kept so that years from now we can look back and see how those decisions were made and with a clear structure that addresses the criteria set out in London plan policy D12A. Now I've written our uh, about a year ago I wrote for our company for Delta uh, our template and we broke it down there was no reason not to have a section for each of those um, policies of the London plan and cross-reference exactly to what it's asking us to demonstrate and do that in six sections. They're not the only section of the report, of course, because there are other things. So the, the planning fire safety strategy should also contain a clear statement that sets out who's written and approved. So section one is it's been written by this person. This is their qualifications, as we do in in vast majority of our reports these days in industry. It should contain information under each criteria. Yeah, we should be cross referencing and benchmarking against each of those policies and also the relevant fire safety codes and standards. So we should be saying we have designed the building in accordance with BS 991 and this is where we've drawn the fire safety guidance that we've inputted into the design. So the London plan fire safety strategy or the planning fire safety strategy rather is a document that will be produced during that planning application that goes and demonstrates how a building that isn't a major development has been designed to meet the requirements of the London plan which is this overall document given to us these series of policies by the mayor of London. This is the guidance that we have there. We can see this was the pre-consultation draft that, that came out in uh, in March 2021. Um, and it states in here that for somebody to do a, a planning fire safety strategy under policy D12 part A. Uh, well, I'll read exactly from the screen. I'll quote what it says. Due to the variety of size, land uses and setting of developments, there are no minimum qualification requirements for the author, author of a PFSS for a planning fire safety strategy. The author should have a suitable fire safety background with the appropriate knowledge, understanding and qualifications commensurate with the size, scope and complexity of the proposed development. So no requirement in there if we're looking at one of these to be, uh, well, let me change what I was going to say. No absolute requirement, no written down black and white definitive. You must be a fire engineer with a degree, chartered member of this institution, any of those kind of things for the part A. If we're doing just that um, non-major development planning fire safety strategy, no absolute requirement in there, but as we all hopefully accept and acknowledge, the individuals undertaking these should have suitable training, knowledge and understanding. They should know uh, the regu relevant regulatory frameworks. They should understand what the London Plan uh, 2021 is. They should understand the building and have worked with design teams and understand fire safety as well, particularly where we've got fire engineered solutions, deviations from guidance, anything like that. Although it's not an absolute requirement to have uh, some training and knowledge in, in fire engineering, Certainly we'd be looking for that if we have got complex buildings and, and deviations as well. This is just a, a flow chart that I picked out of the guidance and it's, it, it details what should happen to that planning fire safety strategy, that PFSS once it's been submitted. So if we start at the top on uh, section number one, the information is provided within the planning fire safety strategy. Uh, if the answer is yes, we go to option number two. Does the planning fire safety strategy set out the relevant qualifications and experience of the author proportionate to the development? If the answer is yes, we continue. If it's no, if if the person hasn't detailed their qualifications, if the person hasn't said or hasn't demonstrated that they've worked on similar schemes and understand the risks, it needs to be resubmitted. If it's yes, we go to the next one. Have we got information for each of the London plan policies? 
If it's yes, we go on. Is the fire safety information specific and relevant to the development? Again, it's a yes, no. Number five here, we're going to come back to at the end, but where lifts are proposed, has the author made a declaration of compliance for another policy that we'll come back to discuss? Yes or no? And if it's yes, is it clear which fire safety design codes and standards have been, uh, the development has been designed to exceed? So lots of things in there, but actually gives quite a good clue for me as a consultant. I know exactly what it is I need to demonstrate here. I won't be submitting these without my relevant qualifications of the author, nor without putting a quote in there or a reference to declaration of compliance for policy D5. Uh, I'll definitely be putting in there the fire safety design codes and standards. So lots of things in this flowchart that tells us, but if we get down to number six and we get a yes, the policy requirements have been addressed as set out in London plan uh, policy D12A. So this gives us a bit of an understanding of the process of what happens at the approvals point uh, once we submit one of these uh, planning applications and one of these fire safety st uh, strategies. So to go on to policy D12B, which is for our major developments, um, we have different policies here, but the reason it's different is because all the policies in D12A also apply. So there's nothing contradictory here. There's nothing that is um, we need to forget about policy D12A. All of that still applies and this is additional. So to go through very quickly again, it says a major development should be submitted with, in this case, a fire statement. And like I said at the beginning, if there's one takeaway from this, I want it to be this slightly different terminology that we'll discuss in the next couple of slides about how if we have a major development, this is where we submit a fire statement different to a planning fire safety uh, strategy. So the fire sta statement is produced by a third party suitably qualified assessor, and the statement details how a development proposal functions in terms of six more policies. And when I say more, what I actually mean is additional. So in addition to policy D12A, there's six more as well. So D12B, number one, we've got the building's construction. So for a major development, we have to be looking at the planning stage at the construction of the building. So the methods, the products, the materials and any manufacturer's details if they're available to us at the time. Part two is the means of escape for all building users. So in slightly more depth at this point, because we're looking at suitably designed stair cores, escape for uh, persons with reduced mobility, anyone requiring level access, associated evacuation strategy approach. Number three, the features which reduce risk to life. So we're still looking as we have done in part A, uh, but this time in part B, the fire alarm systems, passive and active and associated management and maintenance plans. So not only are we putting a fire alarm system in the building, but who's responsible for maintaining it? If we have a residential, which in under certain circumstances would be a major development, who maintains detectors within uh, apartments? And is that different to those maintaining them within the stair and maintaining them within common areas? So we'll be detailing that and trying to put in place some management procedures or at least outline where we would see these uh, responsibilities lying once the building is occupied. Uh, number four, so policy D12B part four, we've got access for fire service personnel and equipment, how this will be achieved in the evacuation situation, water supplies this time we're looking at, provision and positioning of equipment, lift stairs, lobbies, fire suppression, ventilation systems, a lot more detail required here for the major development so that can be coordinated for these higher risk buildings earlier in the design stage here at planning. B12B part five, how provision will be made within the curtilage of the site to enable a fire appliance to gain access to the building. So again, not only we've got access from the public highway, but perhaps if we have to enter a site and we've got a major development, how do we move around internal to that site area? So I'm working on a couple of these at the moment where we've got uh, car parks, basement car parks, for example. Is it suitable to take the appliance down there, plug into a dry riser at lower ground level? These are the things we've looked at under the design of this particular policy of the London plan. And then D12B part six, I'm going to have to shift this slightly so I can read it, uh, ensuring that any potential future modifications to the building will take into account and not compromise the base build fire strategy protection measures. I've had a very long discussion uh, this week about this, about where we're only doing a shell and core fit out. So we're not doing the uh, fit out of the building, we're taking it to Shell and core is part of the base build and we've submitted a London plan statement and we've had to write in here about what we expect a fit out contractor to do and the things that we've not intentionally or unknowingly the things we've imposed on the design to make the overall building work so the very detailed section people often ask me when I'm teaching fire strategies and teaching how to write documents things like this which section is the hardest which one's the biggest it, it's never a clear answer the one I've just finished writing or I'm writing up at the moment this particular policy here is 10 times longer than any of the other ones which I've never had on one of these pro uh, reports before it's because the specifics with this project that I'm working on relates very heavily to future modifications and how they need to be coordinated for the fit out when that comes uh, into fruition 
So exactly as we've done for A, I'll just go through very quickly. Oh, the only thing I'll just define first of all is a major development, which was one of the questions we were asked when we were putting together this uh, this webinar. So if you go into the town and country planning uh, development management procedure, England order 2015, it gives a definition. Uh, the definition of a major development is uh, any development involving any one or more of the following. So if it's the winning and working of minerals or the land or the use of land for mineral working deposits, uh, waste development or the ones we come across most regularly in fire, the provision of dwelling houses where the number of dwelling houses to be provided is 10 or more. So if we've got a, a block of flats and we've got 10 or more dwellings, we are a major development. Or if the development is to be carried out on a site having an area of half hectare or more, or if the provision of a building or buildings where the floor space to be created is 1000 square meters or more. Or finally, we'd be a major development if we are carrying out on a site having an area of one hectare or more. And usually when I do this in classroom, someone says, Joe, can you tell us very precisely what a hectare is? And I Google it in the break. I say, everyone go for a coffee. I'll tell you after the break and I'll Google it. So I've managed to find a way of remembering it for myself. Hopefully useful. Uh, a hectare is 10,000 square meters, 100 meters by 100 meters or 1.3 football pitches. So as it shows on the image there, it's just shy of one and a half football pitches if you put them side by side. Football pitch about 100 metres, 70 metres wide, a bit more than that, that's the size of a hectare. So that if we had a uh, development over that size, we would be a major development and we'd then be subject to policy D12 part B as well as part A. So as we did for the previous one, what we would expect to see in these fire statements this time for the part B. Um, again, it's still a standalone document. It should still do all the things we mentioned about the golden thread, standalone, digitalized, able to be coordinated and uh, understood by all disciplines within a design team. The statement should, though, there are some additional requirements here or from the guidance issued by the Great London Authority. It should contain a schedule of relevant plan titles and reference numbers. So again, for me personally, this is a sources of information box. So saying this is the information I've reviewed in developing this report. It should feature excerpts from the plans as required to assist in its usability. So again, where we've got the example I used earlier was uh, fire appliance access and assembly points, looking at that on a site plan, demonstrating it's uh, suitably close to the building if it's fire appliance or suitably far away if it's an assembly point, but also capable of holding a fire appliance plus kit or all the occupants of the building. So excerpts related to the building itself. Mirror will be reflected in all of the planning application documentation. So, you know, we're all in this realm where you occasionally get a new set of plans, you have to update your reports and it's not something you've scoped for and all that. But as part of this, it has to reflect the most up to date part of the design. As much as I moan about it, I totally get it that designs change. Um, I sit on enough design teams to understand those things um, and be easy to identify as a document and easy to follow. I think it should very clearly state that this is a fire statement in accordance with policy D12B or this is a planning fire safety strategy um in accordance with policy d12a of the london plan 2021 but crucially as it says down at the bottom there this fire statement should benchmark the design against both the benchmark policy of d12a as well as the enhanced ones of d12b for the major development now this is the flow chart that appears in the guidance and i've uh, i'm being picky because i'm marking a lot of student work at the moment so i've had my red pen out and i think it might i think it's supposed to say d12b in the flow chart so uh I'm not calling anyone out. I'm just in red pen mode this week, um, but it's the exact same flow chart. Again, it would show follow the same uh, process. We'd submit the information in the fire statement. Has the applicant made a declaration of compliance? Uh, yes. If we continue from there, has the information been provided under each of the headings for the policy requirements? Again, yes. Uh, if it's no, we go back and we have to resubmit. Is the fire safety information specific and relevant to the development proposal? Well, for me, I'm looking at the sources of information box, making sure that is related to the correct project. Lifts a proposed policy D5. Again, with the final slide talks a little bit about that. And if it's a yes there, has all the information been provided on the design codes and standards? We've designed in accordance with approved document B. We've designed in accordance with 9991, 999, whatever it might be. If all of those are satisfied, we've uh, sufficiently addressed the requirements of policy D12 uh, B in this case, I think it should say, that's why it's in red. So the competence. Now I've spent a lot of time recently thinking about competence and talking about competence and with loads of various things with with different partners about this. We at the moment in the Southern Branch, we're, we're penning an article about competence, some of our feelings and some of our members' feelings. So thank you to everyone who uh, got our newsletter recently and submitted your thoughts on it. That was very, very useful. Um, 
I'm working with some partners at the moment where we're looking at co their competency and things like that. Um, and I'm also at the moment writing part of my curriculum for next year, thinking about what what I think students should learn at university. The competence here for a fire statement is different to the competence for the planning fire safety strategy. You'll remember a few slides ago we said that there are no absolute requirements. It didn't say you have to be a member of the institute, chartered, any of those things. In this instance, it's different because the fire statement applies to major developments and inherently higher risk buildings. So what it says here is uh, I'll read from the left hand side of the screen. So evidence of competence of the author should be detailed in a clearly defined section, as it should be for any of these London plan submissions. And the guidance in this case says that where we've got uh, an author of a fire statement, they should be a fire engineer in this case registered with the Engineering Council. Um, and they should be registered with the Institution of Fire Engineers. It says Institute in the text. I had my red pen out earlier. It should be Institution as it is in, in my text there. Uh, to member grade, MI Fire E grade, and also have suitable evidence of training skills, experience, knowledge and behaviours. That section of the report that is related to the person's background and qualifications isn't the opportunity to show off. It's the opportunity to demonstrate competency to undertake that work. So for a fire statement, because it relates inherently to a higher risk category of building, there is a slightly higher requirement there and some again it's still guidance it's not absolute but it suggests we should have a higher level of competency should we be completing these uh these fire statements now just the last couple of slides just to mop up a couple of bits that again were questions that were posed in developing this uh this short webinar fire statement is a term that is is occasionally mixed up uh, i find and fire statement is something that's obviously crept into our vernacular an awful lot with the Building Safety Bill, uh, becoming the Building Safety Act and all the things that have come about. A, a fire statement is something that we require under the Gateway One process anywhere in England. So if we have a development that's 18 metres or more, and that's measured from ground to the uppermost storey, or we've got seven storeys to the building, we have to submit a fire statement to the HSE as part of our submission nowadays. And that addresses a certain um, elements of the design. Principally, I find fire service access. Again, we'll have a site plan in that gateway one fire statement. Suitability of water supplies is a specific question and relating to the evacuation strategy as well. It, there's a question in there. I think it says in 500 words, any of the fire safety issues. But that is a different fire statement. So that isn't the London plan fire statement. So to, to clarify those definitions just broadly again, if we're looking at the London plan, we're working in Greater London, we are designing at planning stage, we may well have to submit a fire statement. That would be if it's policy D12B, so it's a major development. If it's not and it's just elsewhere in London uh, or anywhere within London, but not a major development, it would be uh, a planning fire safety strategy. But we could be writing a fire strategy in Leeds or anywhere else, and we may still have to write a fire statement. What that isn't is a London plan fire statement. There's something very different. That's our gateway one. Um, and I find myself explaining that Quite a few times so it's, it's worthwhile knowledge i think for us to have that the fire statement that applies under gateway one is a very different document um you can find yourself uh often if you're working on high-rise buildings in london having to in fact write both because they go to different places so our london plan fire statement is something that we would write in order to demonstrate we've met policy d12 be the london plan whereas our gateway one fire statement would be how we've met the requirements of gateway one and beginning to understand the building regulations in relation to what we have for uh, that gateway one approval process, which goes elsewhere. So important definition to understand there that the fire statement, first of all, two definitions that it isn't. One is that it's not for policy D12A, so it's only for a major development. And secondly, this fire statement isn't the same as a gateway one fire statement. And then I think final slides. Um, so. Policy D5, we've we've come across this a couple of times. It's part of our design section, chapter three of the London plan, because it starts with a D, remember it's related to design. Policy D5, um, it is of particular significance to us in, in fire safety, although it doesn't sit under the fire safety policy. It's one that we ought to be aware of. If we read from policy D5B, part five, this is one of the reasons, again, that I advise people when I'm teaching them or I'm delivering training or I'm teaching my own staff, whatever it might be, don't just read the section in the guidance you're looking for, read the one above and below and read around if you can, because this inherently impacts a fire strategy design. Uh, I'll read from the left hand side. It's exactly the same uh, on both sides, but development proposals should achieve the highest standards of accessible, inclusive design. 
They should be designed to incorporate safe and dignified emergency evacuation for all building users in all developments where lifts are installed as a minimum, at least one lift per core should be a suitably sized fire evacuation lift suitable to be used to evacuate people who require level access from the building. Now, that doesn't sit under the fire safety policy of D12. It sits elsewhere. Um, do a control F search for fire and we'll find it. It's in there. It is referenced as well in those flow charts. It says, is there a statement in there for compliance with D5? But it's one for us to be aware of that if we abide fully by the London plan and we're designing lifts uh, into buildings, there has to be some cognizance of fire evacuation lifts in there as well. Big area of us for us in uh, industry at the moment to be discussing and uh, and going through, but it's there in the London plan policy D5. So one certainly for us to be aware of in what is an awareness presentation for us this evening. And I'll just summarise. So I'll go right the way back to the start. I'll say that um, the London plan for 2021 is one of these documents that uh, is often bounded around. And I, I like to give people context so they understand exactly what it is. And what it is, is the current mayor's spatial development strategy for Greater London. Every mayor has a legal duty to submit this, to uh, draw it together. And the iteration we have with our current mayor is the London plan 2021. It provides the policies for adoption in projects throughout Greater London, doesn't apply beyond Greater London, uh, only for planning applications in that area. And we've got a specific policy in there for fire safety, which is D12. Bear in mind these are split into two parts, A and B. And then just a quick note, a targeted question here we've had about minimum qualifications. If we're doing the part A, so D12 part A planning fire safety strategy, there's no absolute minimum requirement for somebody to carry out one of these uh, reviews. But a fire statement requires a competent fire engineer with appropriate registrations. And the one takeaway that, uh, that I'd like people to take if you are looking for a takeaway is that it is a different document to the Gateway One Fire Statement called the same thing, but very, very different. They go to different places. And then just a quick note for uh, maybe just a little memorandum for anyone who's working in fire that we've also got this requirement under D5 to look at evacuation lifts as part of inclusive design. And that brings us to the end. So again, my uh, contact details on there. We might have time for a couple of questions, Dana. I've run over again as I do every time I do one of these, so sorry. Uh, but if you do have questions, drop them through to me on the email and I'll be uh, happy to catch up. So, Dana, I will hand back to you with an apology yeah. that I've run over. That's OK, we're not doing too bad, but I do have more than a couple of questions, um, yeah. so I'll get straight to them. Um, for projects that involve external wall remediation, is D12A still required? If yes, are they looking at the whole building holistically? Ooh. Do you know, I don't know the answer. You've caught me on the first one, but I've been asked this very recently. Someone will chime in and answer it for me. On the product I worked on, it was yes, because it required a planning application to change the external wall. I don't know if that's an absolute requirement, though, in truth. But project I was working on very recently, I think the client might be in the call as well. Um, yes, we had to do it because we did a full planning application to remediate and we had to do a London plan, which meant as we were doing anyway, we were looking at the wider fire strategy, not just the specification for the external wall. Um, so it's a it's it's a yes um, in the case I've worked on recently, and I expect the answer probably is yes as well. OK, brilliant. Just quick fire. Is there a D12 A or B template to use? The slides I put together are exactly from the guidance and it describes what should be in there, which is as good as a template. Um, it just doesn't have a company logo on it. But broadly, I think that the contents as given in the guidance is as good as I could write a template for. It's go through each section individually, put your competency at the beginning and all the pertinent information with lots of uh, cross-referencing in there. So there isn't, unlike, I, I think I can maybe preempt where the questions come from. If you get the fire statement under gateway one, there is a form you can fill in and there is a very clear statement on the government website, uh, a template on the government website, not as such here, but there is a list of required contents you'd find on the uh, the guidance. Brilliant. So enough there to make up your template. Um, I've got a few about Gateway One, so they might have covered most of it about them being two different documents. But will this mesh with the Building Safety Act and Gateway One? I kind of feel like my worry on a higher building is that what you put out right at the beginning in the design, I'm now going to have to justify my safety case. Well, I've deviated so far because things are going to change as you go. Um, do you see any issues? Um. I see any issues. Um, very much personal opinion coming up, not from the IV. Um, no, I won't. I mean, I can't preempt what's going to happen with changes. What I am seeing is that as we are going with Gateway One, we are we are front ending fire strategy design an awful lot, which is in fact a positive move. We're 
we're designing things into buildings earlier we're getting involved earlier um it is difficult to do that sometimes because we're looking at elements of detailed design earlier in the project so it, it is difficult i would like to see whether this isn't me saying i think it'll happen i would like to see the mesh a bit closer um as per the question because in actual fact if you look at something like the london plan statement versus a fire statement there's a lot more involved in a london plan statement even though it's only six categories it asks for a lot more detailed information if you look at the major development one for example it asks for manufacturers details which is not typically planning information i'd be privy to nor under the fire statement under gateway one does it ask quite as in-depth information so i can give an opinion as an answer i can't get my magic ball out and say what'll happen but i would like to see them mesh a bit closer um yeah absolutely and i think it is shifting that way uh anecdotally Brilliant. So where does the term planning fire safety strategy and requirement come from? Is this a term in the main London plan document? No, it is in the GLA guidance that came out um, after. And if you Google PFSS, it's in there. Um, it's not, I don't think, I'd have to control F it, but I don't think it's actually stated within the London plan that that's what it ought to be called. But it's within the guidance that sits behind it, which is why I certainly call it a PFSS. Um, so yes, in the, uh, the the guidance alongside and on the GLA website as well, you'll find that term. OK, uh, evacuation lifts do not stop on all five floors. Um, it's therefore impossible to design these to meet D5. How can we address this? Say that one again, Dana, sorry. What was what was the question? It, uh, this one's from our boss, Joe, so we have to get it right, OK? Uh -oh, evacuation, no pressure, lifts, <laughs> evacuation lifts do not stop at all five floors. Therefore, it's impossible to design them to meet D5. How can we address this? Well, now you told me it's your boss. I might let you answer it, Dana. Do you want to have a go? No, and, um, Emma, you might have to unmic <laughs> and explain I'm that joking. one. <laughs> no, no, I'm joking. Um, um, no, completely agreed. It's one of those areas where we have to be cognizant of a discipline outside of our... Um, our industry so how do we meet part m for example and, and policy d5 whilst accepting that our strategy may not meet those things so whilst the minimum requirement for an evacuation lift might not meet that requirement i'd be looking for input coming the other way to say for inclusive design generally for lifts how do we meet that for example if we've got two lifts in a building one of them for inclusive design should meet every single floor so somebody can access their apartment but then for evacuation, I might design a, a lift specifically for fire safety. And that's why I think it says at least one should be evacuation lift, because you may not have one lift that meets both. Um, so, yeah, it's about that, cognizance of what sorry, detail I, areas. Can I butt in? <laughs> yeah, I, I tend to do this. Daniel will tell you. Sorry, it's Emma <laughs> who asked the question. So Hi, what I'm actually asking is, but for evacuation, lift won't stop a floor with a fire in it because smoke will have activated the, I mean, the smoke ventilation system will have been activated. So the lift's actually not going to stop at the floor to pick up the person who's escaping from their flat. So the fundamental mismatch between calling it evacuation lift and the people that need to be evacuating, the lift won't stop at their floor. So how, it's not an evacuation lift. Yeah. So has I anybody mean, worked out how to do, how to design a, a, an evacuation lift that can be used for self-evacuation? Uh, yeah, I mean, so I have two dissertation students this year both of whom are modelling the new 9991 arrangement with the separate lobby for the evacuation lift, which yeah. is what I think is intended to meet that. I so won't we've share the it. result. I won't we've share the results it, of their it still research. Work. <laughs> yeah, I so won't share the results of their research, it, um, but broadly it, the same answer. Yeah. Yeah. You end up splitting a smoke control system into like three sections because you need to ventilate the lobby and then the two wings that you've got is, is what we find. So um it still doesn't I mean, work. I, you still get smoke follow through. If you've got short corridors, you still get smoke follow through, through into that lobby. Absolutely. Yeah, there is no specific answer to that that I've got. I've modelled it myself and got the same issue. And then try modelling the piston effect in there with the lift going up and down as well. And you'll find further issues. So um, I don't have an answer to that, unfortunately. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a big issue that comes in with evacuation lifts generally. In fact, our last webinar here was from an evacuation lift designer, I think. I didn't I wasn't here for it, unfortunately, but uh, yeah, big issue. And if you look at the new draft triple nine one, um, thank you, Mary, for your message. Um, if you model, if you read the new draft triple nine one, sorry, you find that there are discrepancies related to inclusive design and fire safety, as there are in lots of uh, strategies and guidance documents. So yes, it's a fair question that unfortunately I don't have an answer for. I wish I had an answer. Uh, Emma, <laughs> Me <that'd> too. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah. 
Thank you. OK, just moving on to the next question. Um, are the competency requirements for the Gateway One Fire Statement the same as the London Planning Statement? Uh, no, they're different, aren't they? Um, I think that that says you must be chartered fire engineer, doesn't it, if you're Gateway One? I think it's certainly more uh, heavily enforced rather than being guidance. Um, because under the planning statement for London plan, it's not an absolute requirement. It just says that you have to demonstrate competency and this is recommended. So no, I don't believe they're the same. OK, and we are running out of time. I'll just throw in one more. Which regulatory broad body regulatory, I don't like that word at all, review the London plan fire statement, i.e. building control or the HSE? So, so this is our, so not the HSE, so this is that planning, oh, for the fire statement for the London plan here or for? London. OK, so for the London plan, it's not the HSE, it goes to the local planning. So this sits with, it's in, it's overseen by the Great London Authority, of which the Mayor of London is Chief Executive, advised by London Assembly, reviewed by one of those local boroughs. So we've got our 32 London boroughs that goes as part of our planning application and reviewed in that way. It does actually say, under the guidance, they may consult with the Fire Authority as well on major developments, but uh, as standard, that would just be part of a, a normal planning application that we'd put in. Brilliant, thank you. And there are a few more questions. If I can just ask you to bring up your last page of your slide with your contact details. Um, yeah. And if anyone wants to ask specific questions, they can direct them straight to Joe. Uh, yeah, let me pull that up and show it just there. So I'm more than happy. I've just had 13 messages on WhatsApp, so I presume that's from lots of people asking questions. Uh, my WhatsApp details aren't on there, but my emails are. So come to either uh, my Delta email address or UCLan, I monitor them both together. And I've also got vice president at ifesouthern.co.uk or .org.uk. I think uh, you'll find me there as well. So do feel free to send through more. Unfortunately, we have run slightly over, so I can't answer too many more, but, but there we are. Brilliant. Thank you for coming, everyone. And as you know, we do these on the first Wednesday of every month. So hopefully see you next month.